Um, very pleased to have um, Edgar um, Costa um, who, from MIT, who will speak about um, from Frobenius polynomials to geometry. Hello, uh, Edgar. Um, I'd like also thank the, the organizers to invite me to speak after spending two months trying to make online conference and online seminars available to everyone. It's nice to also participate in as a speaker. Uh, my slides are available at researchseminars.org. Uh, this is joint work with, with many people. Sepan uh, uh, Alcanian, Francis Pite, Jorga Hanel, David Lombardo, Nicola Masco, Yuri Sizzling, Andrew Sadal, and John Voigt. And rule number one for this talk is that you should stop me whenever you feel that you don't understand something. And more importantly, you should tell me to slow down when I start to speak very fast. I post it all around to tell me to slow down, but even on the first minute already messed it up. Okay, so my, my goal today, even before showing the first slide, is that to prevent some simple ideas how to use Frobenius polynomials or Frobenius distributions <coughs> to do symmetric invariance. Uh, indeed, normally I'll call my, my title of my talk for these distributions, but that will be a bit too matchy with the, with the conflict itself. So let me start with um, the, the, the normal standard example, the curves. Even though it's the curve, I like to study at this reduction mod p. And for example, I like to say, like, what can I say about the number of points uh, of this reduction for arbitrary p? Or alternatively, uh, what really I want to do is like, you give me a lot of uh, number of these point counts for me in Can I say something useful about this elliptic curve? Now, the reason I'm starting with elliptic curves is because elliptic curves are very well understood. And every time that you think, ask your question and you have an answer in your head that answers this, I want you to think twice and ask yourself, how does this generalize to something that's not elliptic curve? So first thing, since we all know what Frobenius is, we, we understand that we want to study statistical, statistical properties and we know that studying the number of points is not really the exact thing that we want because uh, Asa tells us that, or he didn't know at the time, is that the number of points is basically p plus one plus the error term, where this error term is just the, the Frobenius trace. So we would like to set the statistical properties of, of the trace of Frobenius, of the elliptic curve. And a natural question is like, what can you say about this error term when I normalize it as p goes to infinity? And hopefully you've seen these pictures before, but there are basically two limiting distributions if I draw an histogram regarding this error term. But it's because there are two types of elliptic curves out there. There's elliptic curves without complex multiplication and the elliptic curves with complex multiplication. And behind the scenes, what's playing the role is the Sato-Tate group, which uh, Gregor's already talked about yesterday, but I don't want to really go into those details. But my point is really, how can I use these APs, these error terms, to try to figure out in which case I am? So if I know, if I take the histogram of these APs, I get these pictures. For example, if I had an effective satotate in the sense of, to the point that tells me that there's a constant that's for how many primes I need to look at to figure out which case I am, I could use that to figure out which box I fit in. But in the case of elliptic curves, things are a bit easier because there are many other ways to figure out uh, what kind of elliptic curve I have. For example, we can use J-invariant. But J-invariant is, uh, is a thing that doesn't realize very well. If you think about it, even if you go to genus two curves, the, the geometric invariants are become a bit more complicated. If you go to genus 10 curves, life, life is much harder. So we want to use something really just about as simple as the trace of Frobenius. So one easy thing that we can notice is that these two pictures, uh, oops, these two pictures deferred the shape and also deferred the, the fact that there's like I put a line in the middle here, and that line is a direct delta. And that just means that when I look at the probability of AP being zero, on one hand, I get something that I expect to be proportional to the size of the, uh, to the size of the interval. And given that I'm normalizing, then I expect it to be one of square root P. 
On the other hand, I know it's going to be one half. So I can already use this to try to distinguish between these two, two, these two, two types of elliptic curves. I go out there, just compute the trace, and figure out how often does AP equal zero. If AP equals zero looks like one half a lot of time, uh, one half for most of the times, then, um, sorry, I said that I said that grammar cor incorrectly. If AP is zero for half of the times, then I have a good evidence that I should be in a complex multiplication case. You should think please as uh, testing primes with the probabilist probabilistic methods. It's not a proof, but it's a good indication. What I want you to notice is somewhat also Alina pointed out uh, before in a previous talk is that knowing AP gives me the, the field of Frobenius, of the field generated by Frobenius. And this field uh, sits inside of the enoffering algebra of the algebraic closure. So in the case that AP is zero is exactly when the field of Frobenius is not the enoffering algebra. Indeed, in this case, it's bigger, it's a quaternion algebra. And so other ways to put the same of AP equals zero is that this is the case that the dimension of the normal algebra is bigger than two. I know these, these are synth tautologies going from one to the other, but later on when you try to generalize these, they'll not be such a tautologies. And even more important that the two plays an important role, which is the minimum value. If I, if I went through all of the primes and I was looking at the dimension of the original algebra over the algebraic, uh, of the algebraic closure, then the dimension will be hit the minimum two infinitely often. And so AP being zero is, is exactly when my infinite you know, algebra is dimension is bigger than two. So how can I use this to distinguish between these two, two cases? Once again, I'm, I'm trying to go as, as basic as possible so that the ideas can generalize later on to other varieties. So the first fact is that if I look at the end of his algebra over F, over F, over algebra closure FP, I know that my end of his algebra over Q embeds in that, or sorry, over Q bar embeds in that. I also know that my Frobenius field embeds in that. So in the case that AP is not zero, then I know that the, the thing in the middle is exactly, um, a quadratic field. So I can use that to try to deduce what this could potentially be. So let's start with a simpler example. In the case of ESCM, then I know exactly when AP is going to be zero mod P. Indeed, uh, for P large enough, we should just ignore the mod P, so we say AP equals zero. And this is like when uh, P is inert or ramified in the CM field of this elliptic curve. So this is equivalent that uh, and it's also the case that when, when the, the end of algebra over Q bar and F bar are, are, are different. In a case that E is not CM, then I can write this uh, somewhat unreal statement that with probability one, if I take two primes, P and Q, and I intersect them. Now we should stop a bit to figure out what the intersection means, but I'm going to ignore that. And I intersect them, I get Q. So, so to make the, the statement more rigorous, that I first I pick P, and then probably one, any Q will work out. And as I said, pointed out before, I can also just look at how often AP equals zero. And I, I will expect that to be proportional to one over square root of P. So this already gives me two clear methods which do not involve any advanced classification of elliptic curves, except the fact that I have two types of elliptic curves. So you could easily code this into some simple program. You could easily try to teach this to some undergrad student, and you can even apply it now without anything advanced. So for example, let's, let me try to look at the elliptic curve. So it's uh, one of the elliptic curves with the lowest conductor, so we have an A2, and I can compute points over F2 and over F3, and I get that uh, my infinite algebra over FP bar, and that was case, in one case, it's Q squared to minus one, and in your case, it's Q squared to minus 11. So I conclude that the only possibility I have for over Q bar is Q. Now, let me look at some different example. So the case with CM. 
So now I need to go to conduct 27. So in this case, what I observe, I start to do, try to do the same analysis before. I'll notice that for every prime that's two mod three, I get a P equals zero. And I can compute that then of analysis with a quaternion algebra. And for one mod three, I always get the same field. So this does not prove me in any way that my, my CM field is Q squared to minus three, or that even a little curve is SCM. But it's a very good evidence. So you should think about this like when you're trying to compute Galois groups. You don't, someone gives you a polynomial, the first, you don't try to compute the Galois group from, from, from the gun. First thing you should do is like, try to look at how the prime split in that number field. And after you have a good guess, you try to prove it. So this I'm just trying to direct you the right way. And then there are other methods to prove that you're correct. So let me uh, try to play the same game again, but now for genus two curves. And that's where the things start to become more interesting because now I don't have two possibilities anymore. I have more possibilities. So if I look at the energy algebra or the algebraic closure and I tensor with R just to make the cases small, I get six possibilities. And while I let you to embrace this, this, this table, I want you to think about the J-invariant analogy. Now, yes, there's out there some table that allows me to go from geometric invariance, try to figure out where I should sit on this thing in some cases, but can you really use them? And can you go after, after like genus three, and genus four, and genus five? So your, your table is going to get more and more complicated and you want to have a method that doesn't rely on looking at a table and trying to do something if you're in that case or not. But still, you can ask the question, can I try to use the same approach as before by just looking at my abelian variety, so in this case, abelian surface, mod p, looking at this reduction and see if I can see something where, where I'm going to fit in this box. So that, that's my question. And for that, now I need to elaborate a bit more. And instead of talking about traces for vineyards, I need to do this as a function. So in this case, uh, I'm just going to focus on Jacobians just because they make my life much easier. So see a nice curve of, of, of genus G, I take its Jacobian and I can just count points of that curve. And I can make that in a, a generating series and I get my zeta function. My zeta function has two, uh, two really nice properties. First is a, a rational function. And I know what the denominator is. Sorry, sorry, yeah, denominator are, are clear to me. And also the all, the, all the arithmetic content is in, in a numerator. And the numerator has degree 2G. And I can compute the numerator in two ways or in three ways, to be honest. So first one is completing these expansion series. Second one is to complete the action for beings on the curve or complete the action for beings on the, on the building surface or a building variety in general. So this allows me to go, that's why I prefer Jacobians in this case, that allows me to just talk about the curve, but still get, get information about my abelian variety. And if you look at the case of genus one is equals two, uh, here we get our usual, what we call AP, because there's only one coefficient, that's why we're only looking at that one. Now, in genus two, we already have two coefficients. And now I want you to think about, like, if I try to do the same game as before, trying to distinguish how many cases I have. So this is what, in some ways, uh, Fiti, Rutger, uh, Kelly, and Sutherland did a couple of years ago. I don't remember many years anymore. It's like trying to classify every possible distribution. And now, even if they have a table of possible distributions, I would like you to, I'd like you to design a computer program, or even you, I give you the first thousand traces, and you're going to try to figure out which one it looks like. And things get harder and harder. So it's not easy to just look at distributions and try to conclude something. But still, if you apply a bit more of our information regarding the relation between a building variety and its reduction, you can say a lot about original abelian surface or abelian variety. Because in the case of a abelian variety or a finite field, these polynomials, this LP of T, basically says many things. For example, it fixes the isogeny class. So just knowing that polynomial, I already know isogeny class. And knowing that isogeny class, I know many things. So let me just state what I want to say, which is, for example, a theorem of Tate. I attribute it to Tate because basically it's a corollary of many of his papers, but he's just telling you that. If I know, if I know my, my Kirsch polynomial of Frobenius acting on a first cohomology group, 
then I can easily compute the dimension for any extension. So I want to focus on that, on any extension, just by one computation. So I exactly know when, not only I know when the algorithm is going to be defined, I also know what's going to be the dimensions all the way. And let's apply that to an example and see how does, how does that go. Well, actually, I've said that in a case that if you want to go full theory mode, you can also use the take theory to even pin down what the endomorphism algebra is up to isomorphism. So take theory tells you that, gives you the variance, and from those events, you know how to pin down the endomorphism algebra. But once again, once you have the variance, it's, it's not easy to figure out what is it exactly. So you need to compare with what you know or to a table. So let's look at the example. Um, so talking about the bin surface over FP is almost given to me as giving you the Fermi's polynomial. So here I give you Fermi's polynomial, which is the Griffith polynomial. So we're talking about the surface. And just applying the, the theorem before, um, I, I, I can figure out that all endomorphisms are, all endomorphisms are defined over F25. And by base changing to F25, then I see that A20, uh, A over, over FP bar is exogenous to a square of non-limpic curve. And from that, uh, I can compute that my, in, in my geometric endomorphism algebra is, uh, is a two by two matrix over Q squared of minus six. So we can now, like we see that we can, by, from this phenomenon, I can deduce all the information. So I, I can go back to the same game I was playing before. I can look at a, a, a beam on surface defined over Q and to look at the reduction apply the same game. So let me do that. So I just repeat the same example again. Now I picked the uh, equivalent of genus two curve over Q. That's its LMFTB label if you want to look at it later. Or you can click on it in my slides. Um, so the, I have the same deduction exactly, but now I can look at another prime. So I can, let me look at prime seven. In this case, the picture is exactly the same. Uh, as you can see, when I base change to the, the quadratic extension in both cases, I get a square, which basically tells me that I get a square of an elliptic curve in both cases. And in both cases, I get a matrix, two by two matrix over some CM field. So what can I deduce from these two information, these, these two facts? So what can I deduce is that uh, if I look back at my table, and again, I'm still using the table, but I'll, I'll get rid of the table soon, is that I cannot have uh, M to C, because in the case of M to C, I'll expect to have, I'll have the same CM field as my center of endomorphisms. Indeed, uh, one can do a bit better. One could even intersect uh, these two endomorphism algebras and conclude that the center must be Q. But we need to think like, how can I intersect two things that do not live inside of something that makes sense? But that's a, that's a technical detail, but indeed we can do that. And indeed I can conclude from here that indeed if I'm inside of a, an orthogonal algebra of dimension four over the center, then indeed the center must be inside of Q. Now I want to also show another approach, which also uses forbidden polynomials, but looks at the other invariant, which is the, the narrow severe lattice, which also behaves very well under reduction. Uh, so for a billion varieties, the narrow severe lattice or, is very easy to, to describe. Yes, when I tensor to the Q, I get endomorphisms, which are fixed under Rosati evolutions. But for us, we can for the, this moment ignore what, what does that mean geometrically. We can just look at the fact that uh, the, as a lattice, they behave very well under reduction. Not only is the, the lattice, um, yeah, it's, it's embedding of a lattice. So the, the pairing is preserved. So a priori, oh, not, not for my question. Um, so a priori, by computing the bound of the dimension, I can compute so, uh, bound on this, and therefore I can compute something very then on in the morphism field. So in the algebra of the Magdalene variety. So let's do that. But before we even go there, we need to, to stop and think uh, there are some conclusions regarding the how the 
these things come up in over finite fields. And the odd thing is that over finite fields, the dimension of the nearest area lattice over uh, FP bar is always an even number, while the dimension over, over Q bar can be any number from one to four for a billion surface. So we already know that in many cases, by just by completing the, the rank over FP bar versus the rank over Q bar, there could be a, a, some discrepancy. So how can we work that away? So I'll show that with an example. And we look again to same, same abelian surface. And in both cases for five and seven, I get, by just looking at the Fermi's polynomial, but it's not using date conjecture, uh, I can deduce that uh, the rank is going to be four over F, F7 bar and F, F, F5 bar. But also by the uh, what's known as Artin date conjecture, I can compute what to, what's the discriminant of the lattice up to squares. And that tells me that on one case, I get minus six, on the other case, I get minus 10. Interestingly, these are the same, exactly the same numbers as shown up before. So this means that I have two lattice, uh, which I know that my nearest severity over Q bar in bands two. They both have rank four here, but they have different discriminants. So therefore, this, this cannot be an isomorphism, must be in the, uh, uh, a strict embedding. So I get my, that the rank must be three. So in this case, for a given surface, this always works. Uh, there's a theorem of Charles that tells us that if you keep pursuing this method, we'll always attain a, a, a tight upper bound. But now is also another, another great time to stop and think how this is generalized to higher genus. And, and it realizes well, but there are some slight issues that when you always look at the um, endomorphisms over finite fields, there's always Frobenius. And Frobenius keeps growing with genus. So you keep getting more extra, extra things that you know that cannot come over uh, from Q bar. So you, you're, you, this, this kind of game that we did here must become much more and more evolved to make get sharper about. So it's a bit interesting uh, case to work out how to do this for just using narrow severity, how to make it get a sharper rubber bounds uh, on the narrow severity of my abelian variety. In the case that P's, we just take one single prime, we can do a bit better by thinking about periodic thickenings, but uh, that's that's a subject for another talk because that's not, not really about distributions. So, but let's look at the, now the table before. But now I'll put, instead of uh, pair it up with the, the rank of narrow severity. So, before we were looking at our example, we managed to rule out the top, the top, the top row, and you can see that exactly with the same approach, we managed to do exactly the same thing. We now know that the rank of nearest severity is at most three, so therefore anything on this row, uh, except the last row, is possible. But on your hand, you can see that also just looking at nearest severity makes some rows to match, and makes it hard to distinguish between these two, these examples. So there are some. There are some good things looking at narrow severity, uh, but other things like it just matches up things because we were looking things that fix in the Rosati, and that does not distinguish between all these examples. Because in this case, the Rosati is just the complex conjugation, so they all become the same. Um, but so all this is all generalized to higher genus because I don't want to be keeping looking at tables and try to say, oh, I rule out that example, I rule out that example. And so let me just set up the, the framework. So they can be right over the, some number field, uh, a number field where all the information are defined. Uh, then I can factor my abelian variety of isogenies. Uh, for each isogeny, I can look at its n-optional algebra. I call those bi's. And I also can look at their centers, li's. And kind of look at their dimensions, which are always a square, so dimension over the center, which is I call the EIs. So with all that description, I indeed, if I knew these, if I knew the, the previous points, I all know that this, this line clearly, which is the end of algebra of my original abelian variety. So what I claim is that what we're doing before is not, uh, we're not just lucky. We can always do this. So the, the theorem that I state is that if Mumford conjecture holds for, for the abelian variety, 
then we need to can compute many of these things. Let me be clear first. Uh, what are we computing? Is not really what we wanted. So first thing, I can figure out the number of factors. And second thing, I get, I don't really get the dimension. I get EI times NI, which is NI with the, the power. And this is a bit annoying. But then also at the same time, I also get NI times the dimension. So it almost gives us what we want, but not exactly what we want. And also we can compute the center. So before telling what goes into the proof, uh, I just say that what, what's the role of Moffat dead conjecture here? The role of Moffat dead conjecture here is telling us that I get a sharp proper bound. So what I'm doing here is that we're doing this by counting points. So you look at primes. And what Moffat dead conjecture helps us here is tells us that at some point we get a tight upper bound. So are we always computing upper bounds which are, are correct. But what Moffat dead conjecture is that at some point I'll stop and find my binds will be all sharp. Uh, the second thing is that, so what's, what's behind the scenes here? What behind the scenes is that is mostly a, a work of Zewina that tells us that uh, we know with, with, there's a set of primes with positive density that we know how the Frobenius polynomial is going to factor. And knowing that allows us to reduce all these. So for example, if you look at the example bef before, we were looking, and I know it's not nice, too, but I'll go back. In this case, I'll, I'll already going to spill the beans. Um, this is a, a, a this is a Jacobian as quaternion multiplication. So we know that over f phi bar, the is always going to factor as a square of elliptic curve. So what David David Zwina did is that generalize this result for uh, any other many other uh, no, sorry, all the other cases. It tells us that knowing that in of algebra over q bar tells me uh, how does the formula is going to factor if the all number and are defined over my ground field. But so uh, I know this is a lot a lot to to process because there's some random things I'm, we managed to compute. But so how does this help us in our table? Because now Yes, I don't want to use, so I'm not using any classification, but we should think about how does this help us compared to a classification that we know. So let's bring us back to something we understand. And if now make sense of all these in terms of the tuples and the dimension of the centers, and put back into a, a Nebula surface case, we see that we, we managed to make some progress. So we can see that the, these two things together, just the dimension of the, of the center and the tuples, allows to distinguish every of the six cases. Even better, in some cases, allows to distinguish even more. For example, in the case of a CM abelian surface, we, we get, uh, versus the product of CM elliptic curves, we get totally different behaviors. So we can distinguish those. Uh, and if you, even the, after that, like uh, RM abelian surface versus uh, product of elliptic curves, also we can see those, but sadly, one of the very interesting examples is that we cannot yet distinguish uh, a cubic QM abelian surface versus square of a non CM elliptic curve. So, just the example I was giving you, I already claimed that's QM, uh, but we don't know yet how to distinguish those. And indeed, we know that we, we can keep looking for all the primes, and every time we're going to look, we're going to see a square of, if it has good reduction, we'll always see a square of elliptic curve. So, how can I distinguish between these two, those two things? And now here, I'm gonna here when it makes sense that to to put some more input that we know about uh, QM abelian surface, and in this case, um, so before I add the fact that I have uh, two by two matrices over Q squared minus three and Q squared minus six, I told you that therefore it cannot be M two C. I hope you agree with that, and I can told you that even we can compute that the center should be Q. So regardless if it's M to Q or uh, indefinite, indefinite quaternion algebra, we can call that the quaternion algebra. And the question is, can we guess the discriminant of, of the quaternion algebra? If it's one, it's going to be M to Q, and it's the square of elliptic curve. If it's not one, it's not M to Q, and that's what we call a Q abelian surface. And the trick here is that if L is ramified in my quaternion algebra, then L cannot split the Frobenius field. Oh, sorry, cannot split in the Frobenius field. 
And using this, uh, we can, for example, look at that 5, 13, and 17 cannot divide the discriminant of the of Pacotinian algebra as they split in Q squared minus 3. Same thing for 7 and 11 as they split in Q squared minus 6. And indeed, you can just try all the primes and you just keep, you're going to keep ruling out primes and primes over and over except 2 and 3. And uh, this is not a proof, but so at, at the moment we, we can conclude that the discriminant of, of, of B is either 6 or 2 or 3 or something with a very high prime. Indeed, I can tell you that the discriminant B is 6. Uh, and the question now you should, you should ask is that at some point, how can I tell you that? How, what that can I give you as a proof that convinces of that? And this is the thing I've been hiding under the rug for a bit, is that uh, this whole talk I'm talking about upper bounds. So I'm telling you that my upper bound is sharp, but at some point, if you're not writing a paper that that, that Jacobin has QM multiplication, so, uh, sorry, has quaternion multiplication, then you need to prove it somehow. And um, there are other methods, which is also the part of the joint work with uh, sizzling mass going voids, that allows us to reconstruct from complex approximations divisors that represent uh, the endomorphisms. So after I'm really convinced that I have a, a genus two curve with uh, quaternion multiplication, I can go to my computer, uh, uh, compute a lattice in, uh, by thinking about my abelian surface in C. I can see that also C tells me that it looks like quaternion multiplication. And then I can, uh, by applying some kind of a Newton lift, we can con reconstruct the divisors to tell us that indeed we can find divisors. Here they are. and Indeed, they act as quaternion multiplication. But that takes us away from Frobenius distributions. Uh, so I'm not going to talk more about that. But there are other ways that we can also deduce things about my, my abelian variety by just looking at Frobenius polynomials. So, so first thing I want to point out, and I know this is bad practice, but I go back, that in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous theorem, I'm only talking about them from algebra over Q bar. And in some ways, like almost we're losing a lot of information. So the question is, can we get some of the Galois structure of my infinite algebra? Right? I would like to understand how does my Galois algebra uh, sorry, on my on my in over what fields that these n of them start to show up. In for example, in the case of the of this Jacobian. In this case, I think it's over Q. So now I'd like you to look at the table and ask you, can you spot the pattern? So let me be clear what I mean by this. Uh, so this M2 is what we call the second moment of the A1. So A1 is at the trace. So uh, I'm just looking at the satellite group of my building variety. And I'm looking at the trace of it and taking, and taking expected value. Are, are those questions for me or? Sorry, I just see questions. Okay, it's just you talking around. Um, and the, the other table is, is the expected value of the second trace, so the second coefficient of the Chris polynomial, of the Fermi's polynomial. So at this time, I really like to have an audience because it can tell me if you can spot the pattern or not. Uh, and I'll tell you the pattern. So the pattern that, uh, oops, sorry. So these numbers here, are exactly the dimension of this column. And these numbers here are exactly those numbers. And uh, I believe that uh, Sonia Kim also knows this pattern. And indeed, this, we can make this a theorem. And the theorem is that if I have an, a, a Nabilian variety and I have a typo, is all right, uh, then I, my rank of my number algebra is the second moment of, of, of the trace. And the rank of narrow severity is the first moment of the second coefficient of the crystal polynomial. So what I mean by this is alternating, alternating square. So in other words, to make it more precise to something that we understand, that we assume satellite conjecture, basically it's telling that uh, if I compute the trace of my Frobenius action and normalize it, then I should get the expected value of that. It was going to give me the, the n of things algebra. And if I look at the trace of Frobenius acting on H2, 
and then I'll normalize it again. So in that case, I take a take list, then I get the rank on error severity. And the magical thing about this, uh, this does not depend in any, on any classification. Indeed, what's behind the scenes is state conjecture. That's, that's the, the trick here. Um, and also this does not depend on even varieties in any way. As long as state conjecture holds, we can write the same statement as before. For example, we did not write this in the paper, but I claim it, that we take X degree KV surface, and now the same thing happens. Now, my satellite group now is defined over the, over the second group of cohomology. So I get again that the, uh, the, fir the first moment of the trace, which you should really compare to this guy, because this guy can be written as a trace of Frobenius on H2, gives me the rank of narrow severity. So exactly the same result, because it's using exactly the same proof. And so another way to write it down is that if satellite conjecture holds for k surface, or for this k surface, then we just by counting, just by counting points and deducing what's the trace and taking an expected value, I should be able to deduce what's the rank of the narrow severity. Um, and now I would like to ask you what else can you deduce about given varieties? So Mark in his talk shows us like a, a very nice trick about how to do distortion. And there are many other tricks that you can do with from just using from minimal normals to tell you something about the given varieties. But there are some things I cannot do. For example, I cannot yet figure out how to compute the, uh, the degree of the enormous field. So the field where all my enormous are defined by just looking at traces, uh, by just looking at Fermi polynomials. Like I can get uh, lower bounds, but I cannot get a sharper upper bound, uh, sorry, a sharp lower bound in any way. And there are cases like I, I know I cannot, I cannot make it work. So I really wonder what, what else can we do just by looking at the Fermi polynomials. Now is also a good time to ask questions, if anyone has questions. And I see some discussion in the chat, but I think it's just not relevant. Okay. Okay, so- I think so far so good. Oh. So enough? far so good, so you can go ahead. Okay. Um, so I, I, I told you about KFI surface, but I'm not yet told what KFI surface is, I'm aware of that. Uh, because now that's my segue to, keep, to move to K-free surface. So K-free surface is basically one of the possible generalization of elliptic curves. It depends on how you want to think about it and what property you really love about elliptic curve. Some people, they love the fact that it's a group, a group and other people love that the fact that it's some nice cohomologic properties. Uh, so the way you should think about it is a surface. And if you put in P3, it's just a smooth, it's a smooth quartic surface. So, Something defined by degree, uh, sorry, a polynomial degree four. But perhaps more, more natural for people that have thought about genus two curves or, or hyperlytic curves, you can think about this as a double cover of P2. So basically, hyperlytic curves are double covered of P1, these are double covered of P2, and if you fix the degree equals six, then you get a K free surface. So my, my, my question now is can we play a similar game as before? Now, if you know something about the free surface, you know that now the, the cohomology group, the dimension of it, the Betty number just became much bigger. Now it's 22. So it's not as easy to look at traces, not as easy to look at the uh, number of points. What else can I look at? So in this case, instead of looking at number of points or, look, or looking at trace, I want to look at the rank of narrow severity. And as before, for the billion surface, uh, these only can take even numbers over fp, or sorry, fp bound. So now is the time that the, I should tell you perhaps a bit more about what the narrow severity. So in this case of, the, of a KP surface, you should be thinking about narrow severity as curves instead of the surface uh, up to numerical equivalence. So think about the simplest example. So you take the, your quartic surface in P3 and you intersect with the hyperplane. So you get a quartic curve instead of your quartic surface. Now, if you smooth your hyperplane a bit and intersect again with another hyperplane, you get another curve. But those two curves, those two, those two quartic curves, instead of the, the k free surface, up to numerical equivalence, they're identical. They behave exactly the same. So just think about some things that is about cycles in cohomology that represent your that represent your curve. But so before we get lost in k free surface, let's try to go back to elliptic curves. 
So I claim these are analytical analytic curves. So maybe there's some analogous. And analogous here is, is, is very simple what we're doing before. Uh, and instead of like looking at traces or Frobenius, it's looking at the rank of the inference algebra of my elliptic curve. So in this case, there's two or four, either a quadratic field or quaternion algebra. And I want to, to recall in the case of I get four exactly if and only if AP is zero or AP, mod P, AP equals zero mod P. I forgot about mod P there. And in the case of uh, AP equals zero, there are two cases that can happen. If my elliptic curve has no, no, has no CM, then I get, I expect probably to be one of square of P, and this is what's known as length proper conjecture. And if my elliptic curve has CM by some quadratic field, then I know it's gonna happen probably one half. Indeed, I know which prime is gonna happen. It's gonna happen to the ramified or inert primes in that quadratic field. And this is actually very similar to what everyone observed, but now in the case of flank trotter, we understand exactly, we have good reason why that happens. And in the case of the K-free server, not, it's not be clear why, why is that happening, but let me not talk more about that now. And so if I generalize to a linear surface, uh, then perhaps the easiest way to think about neuron severity is to think about endomorphism anom uh, fixed by the resulting evolution. And now I can think about what does this map means again. I can break it down for you. So, so if I take a little uh, abelian surface over Q, then I know that my neuron severity can take uh, numbers two, four, six over, over FP bar. In the case that's bigger than four, it means that my abelian surface over FP bar is either just a square of elliptic curve. And in the case it's six, it needs a square of elliptic curve and the elliptic curve is super singular. So I hope that this gives you some ground to what, what I'm thinking about. But in general, the, the whole picture for a K-free surface is a bit more complicated because now uh, the, the numbers that can go, it can go from one to 20 and over FP bar can go from two to 22. But very similar to what you observed before for the elliptic curve, uh, you should think about this like, there's something random that happens over, over FP bar but it's not totally random because there's a theorem of Sharp that tells that uh, you're going to hit the minimum value infinitely many times. So if there's a minimum value that happens, you're going to hit it infinitely many times. So it's like the, the times that you do not hit the minimum value are the ones that are special. And so this leads us like to like exactly the same case as for elliptic curves. Lucas leads us to ask about when, when do we not hit the minimum value? So we can decide that set and just realize that that set uh, for the elliptic curve will be the set of uh, super single primes. And also can look at this density of that set. So what can I say about those two sets? Uh, I, can say, I can say very little, but before I even was able to say anything about it, I had to do some numerical experiments to get some insight. And these numerical experiments come again from competing for minus polynomials. So let's do some numerical experiments. So let me pick two generic K-free surface. And in this case of, of a K-free surface, oops. Uh, generic means uh, that the, the rank of narrow severity is one. And uh, given that we, we, we know a bit about the type group, maybe a way to, to convince you that these are really generic because there are many ways that think something can be generic. Indeed, the, the subject group of these two uh, K3 surfers is, is going to be O21. Or I cannot prove that, but numerically it looks like O21. And what are the plots are looking at here? The plots are uh, in log log scale of the proportion of primes that are exceptional. I call them exceptional or, or, prime or primes where my rank jumps. And what did I put in log log plot is to show that they indeed behave as something like. Uh, some constant of over square root of b. Oops. Uh, so, if you do some reverse engineering, you, you have you are if you have thought about length trotter before, you see that that behavior is very similar to length trotter behavior. So you can recently deduce that uh, perhaps the probability of p jumping is about one square root of p. 
And now the, the, the major question is why? Uh, my computer is struggling. Uh, okay, sorry. And so, oh, sorry, I'm really my computer is really strong with the slides because I don't see it. Anyway, I'm I'm move forward. Okay, now we're fixing the slides finally. Um, and I really want to think about this, uh, the, the why, because in the, in the case of a elliptic curve, the, the, the heuristics for one of square root of P has to do with the fact that elliptic curve is as weight one. Oh, sorry, as multiplicative weight one. Some things behave as, no, the normalization factor is square root of P. But for a KP surface, its weight is two. The normalization factor is P. So it's a bit, it's a bit odd that the behavior is uh, one of square root of p. Now let's look at other examples. And let's look at the uh, k-free surface uh, with rank equals two. So it's a, basically there's a filtration in the next interesting example. Now I don't do log of an, anymore because the picture is totally different. So look at three examples and what I observe is that the density is converging to what looks like perhaps one half but this not even looks like um, one half. It's like it's always oscillating around one half, like literally above. And I claim there's no obvious trend. And indeed, when I was doing this graph for the first time in my life, I even uh, wondered like, could it be related to some integer being a square model of p? And it's very hard to, to decide that. But at the time I said, no, there's no way, because if I look at the, integers mean square model of P and I look at the proportion. I know that I should be crossing the 0 0.5 line infinitely often. Yeah, there's a bias to one of the on one of the sides, but I should be crossing it over and over. And this line is never crossed uh, below the 0 0.5. And indeed, I was wrong. They are neither to some integer being square model of model P. And uh, this is a result of uh, together with Elsen Yan and Yanel that tells us that we can compute if if our if our rank of, over q bar matches the minimal rank over f p bar. Another way to say this is that my k free surface does not have real multiplication, and some parity things do not happen. Uh, then there's a, a integer that tells tells that the primes that will, that the set of primes that are inert on that quadratic field will be a subset of my jumping primes. And in general, like we can say that dx is not a square. And now if you want to write this in terms of subtotate, uh, subtotate groups, what I we're telling you is telling you that we can exactly tell you uh, for if what quadratic extension you need to take to go from your subtotate group being inside of O to SO. So very similar to what Greg, uh, Gregory was saying yesterday. And the only reason why I was looking at this was uh, that in this case, if if, by, if my quadratic extension is non-trivial, then I can show that the density is at least one half. And uh, a known argument of, from Lee and Liek gives us that indeed my KP surface has infinitely many, infinitely many rational curves. So now I, I told you the, 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 the facts. Now you should ask why this graph does not look like something that looks like a quadratic, some, something related to some quadratic extension. So there are two things. First thing is that the, the discriminant of the discriminant, uh, sorry, the that dx for those three examples is quite large. Indeed, it just goes up off the screen for a long time. So there was no data enough for me to even realize that that could be the case. And there's also a second a second behavior on my last 30 seconds, is that there's other behavior working behind the scenes against uh, the idea of looking at just looking at the graphs, that just like with elliptic curves or, or like or like in general, it's like subtotate groups, I can just now base change my field to try to see a different behavior to see how my subtotate group changes. So in this case, I can just base change to my quadratic field and ignore the things I already know what, what happened. And if I ignore the primes that I know already in jump, so basically if I base change to that quadratic field and I do the same experiment again, I observe a different behavior. 
I observe again the, the C over square root of BB over again. So in, in, in summary, and to finish, in this case, the primes that jump, they have two, two reasons to, to do it so far. Either uh, dx, the discriminant is not a square model of P, or is pro with probability one of square root of P. Now, the probability one of square root of P, I don't, I don't know why. And that's really the question I want to leave you with and finish my talk. That's it. Um, well, thank you very much for your great talk, Costa. Um, let's thank to thank to the speaker. Um, if you have some questions, um, please raise your hand or just unmute yourself. Okay. Um, Adam Logan has questions, so I can unmute you. I did. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I just wanted to ask, do you have data for larger rank? I mean, is, is it only dependent on the parity? Uh, yes, I should have said this before. Uh, it was my notes that yes, this is like totally parity dependent. Thanks. It's like if it's, if it's odds, you always, I always observe one square of P. If it's even, then either you observe one half, or you observe one of square of p depending on the screen being square or not. Right, thanks. Are there any other questions for Edgar? Yeah, in the in the example uh, that you showed to us, that you numerically guess that it 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 has quaternionic multiplication, in the, the discriminant of a quaternion algebra is six. You do you have any idea of how far uh, do you have to go to be able to, uh, to ensure that the discriminant is six or? I'm fine to get that. No, so, so, so okay, I'm, I'm not going to move the slides. My, my computer is having a hard time with the slides today. Uh, so the, the problem is the following, that you, every time you, you go up to some, some, some uh, you try some Frobenius field, you can rule out a lot of primes. But there are some primes you cannot rule out. For example, the primes that, that are ramified on that field. So you need, now you need to go to other, you need to find another prime, which will give another Frobenius field. So there's always some primes you cannot rule out. So you, I don't know, like you, you keep, you keep, you, you can rule out all the primes that you want, but you just need to keep using more and more for these fields because you might be just unlucky that the first primes, the first ten for these fields that you try, do not rule out, let's say five. Or I can tell that uh, is it is not easy, to, is it's not hard to construct examples that you, you can come up with that will not rule out everything. But you can, what you can see that you keep going far and far and far away, then you, you can find a, a prime that gives you Frobenius that allows that original prime and, and you keep that, that argument. But I don't know what's the, what's the I don't have in a, even a, a sharp idea of how far we need to go. There, there could be some upper bound uh, in terms of the conductor, for example, or. True, but all, all these, I, I, I in terms of effectiveness, I expect there's a, uh, there's a, I really wish I could go back to my slides. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a, there's this effect, effectiveness question because I'm just looking at primes and how, how, how long does it take me to get the tight upper bound? And at the moment we just know about, we only know densities. We know that there's positive density that gives you that, but we don't have a, we have not yet tried like to do an effective Shabbat RF to try to tell you like, there's a constant, and here's how many primes you need to try. Okay. We don't know. Thanks. Um, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like to thank to Edgar again.